Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Our state prides itself on a reputation for quality in our natural environment, our real maple syrup, and the family farms that produce fresh local food. For the past five years, Vermont's annual Open Farm Week has helped highlight the diversity of farms, everything from pick-your-own operations to cheese-making classes and farm stands. Next week, the sixth annual Open Farm Week will showcase farms and farmers up and down the state. From August 10th to the 16th, you can visit your local farmer, get a behind-the-scenes look at the vibrant working agricultural landscape, and purchase some of the tasty locally grown food. Of course, the coronavirus requires a new approach to Open Farm Week, and so the organizing team is putting together events and activities appropriate for the current pandemic-related guidelines. Across the Fence spoke with one of the organizers about this year's Open Farm Week. Open Farm Week is a uh, celebration of our Vermont farms and farmers. Uh, it's really an opportunity to get outdoors, um, get a behind-the-scenes look at where our food comes from and enjoy authentic um, food and farm experiences. It's really a chance to build relationships with the working landscape and our local farmers. So I'm hearing you say it's for anyone who enjoys food, farms in Vermont. The trifecta, food, farms in Vermont, okay. Now, so it's an understatement to say that this year is a little different than your previous five years with Open Farm Week. So. What thoughtful, considerate, careful ways are you putting this together given the current health crisis? You know, this year, um, every year, the events um, and the farms really show off the diversity of our agricultural community and the unique um, experiences people can enjoy. Um, and this year in particular, we, were, uh, we wanted to focus on experiences uh, that were current, that use the current social distancing guidelines. So people uh, can go on uh, farm tours and pre-register for those. We, we have a listing of farms that, um, where you can just visit for a picnic. Also, we have a new initiative this year, um, farm, walk, farm walking trails. And um, that'll, that'll be lots of fun. People can spend time outdoors and uh, enjoy you know, going for a walk on a farm trail. It seems like a perfect example in this day and age, again, where everybody's looking for that opportunity, whether it's their uh, uh, community walking trails. So this is a new opportunity, a chance to get out on some hiking trails and to have these tours. So if I'm interested in a tour, do I need to pre-register? Do I need to call or do something in advance? Well, yes. Um, some of the events you do need to pre-register for and um, it's not for anything just so that the farmer will know that you'll be there. Uh, we, have some, we have a new vineyard in Grand Isle that um, we'll be launching soon, we'll be, and you have to register for a vineyard tour. But I think this year more than ever, we do need to pre-register for things, um, but that doesn't, of course, diminish the experience and we can, you know, you can still have a lot of fun. So we'll get to that registration website, phone, all that information in just a moment. I know from talking with you in years past that one of the great aspects of Open Farm Week is that every farm is different. There's a real diversity. And so the events and activities depend on where you go, correct? Oh, yeah, certainly. And I forgot to mention, we are also doing online events and virtual tours this year. Um, that is a really, um, that's a fun addition this year. Um, you know, it really depends on where you want, where you go. On one hand, if you want to do an online cider tasting, you can do that from your home. On the other hand, if you want to go have a picnic and um, pet Highland's, those Highland beef um, cattle, um, you can do that. Uh, it, it really varies and um, it's all about the personality of the farm. We even have uh, herding demonstrations on a uh, local sheep farm. So uh, tell us, where can folks go to get information about this year's Open Farm Week, Dara? Um, they can go to uh, diginvt.com uh, forward slash vtopenfarm. 
So that is really the virtual home. And in checking that before I visited with you, I can already see farms that have uh, the diversity of farms that are on the list. And again, some are fruits and vegetables, other major dairy. There's a there's an enormous diversity in the farms, and that's where people can go uh, to find things out. Uh, uh, once again, diginvt.com. Uh, one final question, it goes something like this. In addition to Vermont Fresh Network, UVM Extension and others play an important role in Open Farm Week. Can you give us some examples of the partners and extension and how this comes together? Of course, of course. Open Farm Week um, is an initiative of uh, the Vermont Farm to Plate Network. So we work collaborat collaboratively with, uh, of course, UVM Extension, Vermont Fresh Network, uh, NOFA Vermont, um, the Agency of Agriculture, uh, Vermont Department of Tourism, um, and, and a few other um, organizations like the On-Farm Education Network. We all work together to really show off the state um, because there are so many, it's such a unique place and, and um, why not get outside and enjoy a farm? Once again, to learn more about the events and activities of next week's Open Farm Week and to register in advance, go to diginvt.com. It's the height of the growing season, but in just a few weeks, we'll be talking about the season's harvest. So for our next segment, we're looking ahead to fall and some of the issues you might see in your garden squash and other vegetables. To learn more, we join UVM Extensions Ann Hazelrig in her plant diagnostic clinic. Here we are in Jeffords Hall. We're in the Plant Diagnostic Clinic, which is a clinic set up for commercial growers, home gardeners, master gardeners, uh, all across the state of Vermont to be able to send in disease, insect, or weed samples. And then we identify what's wrong, and then we make recommendations for control. Um, we get about five or 600 samples a year, but now we get a lot of emails and pictures too. So we're we're busy. And this is also, my lab is gonna be the future home of the Master Gardener Helpline. So we'll have helpline volunteers in here uh, helping home gardeners identify problems. So uh, I brought in a couple things that we're seeing in the clinic right now. These are fall issues. Uh, the first is a, a butternut squash, and this is actually from my home garden. <laughs> I've got all the diseases. But it's a fungus disease uh, called black rot, and it's a very common problem on this squash. And you sort of see these concentric rings where the fungus is invaded, and it also has a foliar and a stem portion too to the disease. But this is what we see at this time of the year. For home gardeners, it's really no problem. Uh, it's perfectly fine to eat. I would just not store these for very long. I would go ahead and cook them, and they're perfectly fine. It's, at this point, it's a superficial rot. So, eat it early and it's it's all good but it may not store as long as as you'd like it to so that's the black rod on butternut squash this is another one that's uh come in from the as a picture and it's also out in my garden too it's a buttercup squash and this is a disorder called edema and what it's uh, caused by is fluctuating soil mo moisture which we certainly have had this summer you know on the dry side but then we've gotten a few rains um, so again, it doesn't cause any real problems. It's perfectly fine to eat. It's more of a, it doesn't look as pretty as, as what it should look. This is another issue that I've seen um, coming into the clinic. This is uh, just plain old sunburn, I think, on this acorn squash. Again, no, no problem. Just go ahead and eat it. Some of these may not store as long. So I also have a few slides of, of things we we're going to get calls on. We've gotten a few, but I anticipate a lot of calls on, and that's uh, the home invaders. And I'm not talking about the human kind. <laughs> These are all insects, and there are three different home invaders that we see a lot in Vermont, and it always causes concern among homeowners. Uh, that's the uh, multicolored Asian lady beetle, the western conifer seed bug, and the box elder bug. So uh, my first slide of the uh, multicolored Asian uh, lady beetle, this is a little bit larger beetle than our normal ladybug that we see all the time. And it can be from yellow to orange in colors. And it could have zero to up to 19 spots. Um, and this little lady beetle was actually introduced into the US by the USDA in the 1970s 
and 80s um, to feed on aphids and scale. But it's really proliferated and it's really not a pest problem, it's actually, it's just a nuisance problem because there are several generations of this insect per year and then right about this time of year when the nights get cold and we still have sunny days, especially on the south side of houses, these beetles congregate and then they try to get into the houses through cracks and crevices to overwinter. And so, uh, and then once they get in your house, another problem with these is that they, if disturbed, they exude this yellow, foul-smelling substance that can also cause spots on your uh, walls or furniture. So I think the first line of defense for these is um, you want to seal up any cracks and crevices, you know, caulk your windows, uh, make sure your doors shut tightly, just try to exclude them. Don't use an insecticide. It's just it's not worth it and you certainly don't want to use an insecticide inside the house. Um, the other thing you can do is just vacuum them up. Uh, that's got to be kind of satisfying. So, <laughs> But b basically don't use an insecticide. The second pest is this western conifer seed bug and this is a fairly large bug. It's about three quarters of an inch long. Um, kind of an impressive looking insect. Uh, but it feeds on the seeds and developing cones of conifers. So it's really not a, a pest per se, but again, it's a nuisance. Um, they only have one generation per year, but again, like the lady beetles, when it gets cool nights and we still have these warm sunny days, especially on south sides of walls, they congregate and they're gonna try to get into the house too. So same thing goes for these, you know, caulk, try to exclude them, and if they get inside, just pick them up and throw them back outside. They don't bite uh, or vacuum them up. Okay, the third pest kind of works the same way as these other two. It's a, a nuisance. It's called the box elder bug, and it's got this black and or, uh, red coloration. They're kind of pretty bugs, um, but again, they're looking for these fall overwintering sites. So they may get in the house, same thing goes, caulk things, suck them up with a vacuum, and, and don't worry about it. One other problem that uh, I've gotten a few calls on is a um, potato disease called scab, and it's kind of a cross between a fungus and a bacteria. And this has a real corky appearance to the skin of the potato. They don't look so pretty. But uh, again, if you're a home gardener, these make perfectly good mashed potatoes. Just uh, peel off that skin and go ahead and cook them. They're just fine to eat. Next year, uh, you might want to rotate the potatoes, but this, this uh, organism is in, the, in all soil. So some years it's worse than others. The other thing you can do for that um, particular problem is look for resistant varieties. If you consistently have that issue, try to find resistant varieties. Many thanks to Anne for those tips. And as always, thanks to you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.